In this installment, I'm talking about electronic mind control and the role deception plays in it, which turns out to be substantial. Before I get into that, some introductory information you might not have been aware of. Electronic mind control is actually old technology, much older than the non-lethal weapons technology you've heard about in the news. It's been known since the 18th century that electrical impulses can stimulate muscles and cause them to act. In the mid-20th century, a scientist, Jose Delgado, did some experiments on humans and animals. He implanted electrodes in their brains and sent electrical impulses to see what he could get the test subjects to do. His work was peer-reviewed, there were plenty of witnesses, and he's been written up in Scientific American. This really happened decades ago. Now, everything you hear, see, or feel has to be processed by your brain. In principle, electronic mind control can not only get a test subject to do things, but to feel artificial sensations, things that aren't really happening. However, the tools at the time weren't sophisticated enough to probe what test subjects were seeing or hearing. Delgado had to rely on interviews with human subjects to find out what they thought, or look at the reactions of non-human test subjects. He could get his test subjects to do a lot. He could induce rage reactions in animals at will, for example. With the press of a button, he could make a cat's hair stand on end. It would arch its back and hiss. With the press of a button, he made a bill stop charging. At will, he could make animals take certain actions in sequence, and he could do this over and over again. He could evoke actions in human test subjects at will. And by interviewing the test subjects, he confirmed what the evoked actions of animals would make an observer suspect. They thought their evoked actions were entirely natural. He'd make a subject's head turn, and then he'd ask the subject why he turned his head. The subject always rationalized his actions, which weren't really his idea, saying things like, I heard a noise, I was looking for something under the bed, and so on. Delgado stumbled upon an important truth in his research, that the conscious mind isn't truly in control of the body in real time. It's more like a witness that rationalizes the body's actions after the fact. Think about that for a minute. Think about the things you've done in the past few hours. Are you sure someone wasn't making you do them? How would you know? Anyway, the CIA was and is very interested in this kind of research. There's a story from the 50s, you can look this up online, where the CIA created a multi-million dollar cyborg cat. They wired it up so they could see everything they were seeing, so they could remote control it, and so on. On the CIA cat's maiden voyage, it walked across the street and got run over by a car. This is an amusing story, one which makes the CIA look like clowns coming from the CIA. You might want to consider the source. Even if the story is 100% accurate, there's no reason why the CIA couldn't do this over and over again until it got the technology right. I mean, why not? You're paying for it. There are indications that, in fact, the CIA and the Department of Defense did continue with experiments along those lines and got much further. For example, there's a group of Vietnam veterans who took part in the Edgewood Arsenal experiments, also known as Project 112, and are now attempting to sue the CIA, saying that, among other things, they received brain implants and were subjected to mind control experiments. In the 1970s, Project MKUltra was partially exposed. Unfortunately, the most damaging documents were destroyed. But testimony from survivors indicates that the CIA was implanting subjects of those experiments as well. You haven't heard anything about the subject since the 1970s. Apparently, the United States doesn't do this sort of thing anymore. And if you believe that, well, you better stop listening to this audio right now. Back then, the implants and electrodes they used to control test subjects were bulky. Computers and electronics have gotten a lot smaller since the mid-20th century. This is something you might want to keep in mind when evaluating the testimony of victims. I've been in touch with some victims who have bulky foreign objects in their bodies. We don't know for sure what the function of those objects are, 
but it's difficult to imagine why they'd be placed there, except as part of mind control experiments the victims are complaining about. The newer stuff doesn't show up on scans. That doesn't mean it's not there. This brings up a phony issue. Let's say you have an implant or implants. What do you do? It's very costly to detect implants or prove their functionality. Having detected foreign objects in your body, should you undertake expensive or dangerous medical procedures to remove them? They shouldn't have put those objects in your body in the first place, but now, there they are. How do you get the responsible party to pay for the cost of removal? How do you prove that a specific third party put them there to make them accountable? If you can't get someone to pay for it, should your government pay the cost of removal or disabling of the implants? What if you were in this position? What do you think should happen? It's very important not to get hung up on the technology. There's only one right answer but many ways to be wrong. In the absence of a major reverse engineering effort, which nobody except the government can afford, in the absence of testimony from scientists and engineers who have actually worked with the technology, you're probably going to have misconceptions about how it works. I'm trying to win out nonsensical answers, but it's tough. Now, a concept I'd like to introduce you to is mental surveillance. If you can pick up the electrical signals in the brain from a distance, you could theoretically decode them and pick up visual images and other sensations, and even verbal thoughts. This involves some computationally intensive digital signal processing, but intelligence agencies are willing to spend the money to make it happen. And the NSA has always had the most powerful computers in the world. Let's say that targets of mind control experiments are implanted. Well, any receiving device is by default a transmitting device. It takes extra engineering to make it not work that way. But again, let's not get hung up on the technology. There's only one right answer, and as outsiders, we're not going to have it. Subjects of mind control experiments in the present day have very specific reasons for believing their minds are being read. But of course, they can't prove it, any more than you could prove your privacy is being violated right now. You'd only find out about unlawful intrusions on your privacy indirectly. Like for instance, let's say someone steals your identity and runs up a lot of bills under your name. You wouldn't find out until months or years later. And you wouldn't know because they told you they stole your identity. You'd know because of the problems that resulted. Identity theft is actually a good example because only as few stolen scraps of information is all it takes to cause you a lot of grief. Now imagine that someone is having their most personal information taken from them 24 Stop. hours a day. Are you going to understand company? why the subjects of this treatment are so upset? Anyway, the evidence of surveillance tends to be indirect. And in the case of mind control victims, it can also be deceptive. But there's no question that surveillance plays a major role in mind control operations. Just look at it this way. To control something, you have to watch it. All this stuff is very, very difficult to prove. To make things worse, the experimenters are obviously reading the American Psychology Association's diagnostic manuals, and the technology lets them duplicate many of the symptoms of mental illness. And merely being labeled as mentally ill creates a virtually impossible hurdle. Just as it's difficult to prove you're being targeted by someone with mind control technology, it's difficult to prove that you're not mentally ill. It would be a lot easier to prove these things with enough money in hand, but part of the process involves stripping the mind control target of all assets. And since that process is deceptive, the target is fighting the wrong things and walking into one trap after another. Only after a mind control victim is broke does the hammer get dropped and is allowed to glimpse how the system really works. What makes all this possible is deception, the deceptive use of mind control technology. Just as magicians use slate of hand to deceive their audiences, the experimenters use something that I call slate of mind. One more detail before I get into the deceptive tactics used. The technology seems to be usable on lots of people around the target, and that really helps out a lot with the process of deception. This shouldn't be surprising. It's clear that the applications for this technology are much broader than just experimenting on the thousand or so people who are complaining about it. 
It's overreaching to say that you was born everyone. Victims are getting some special treatment and might not be choosing their places to live of their own free will. They might be moving into heavily controlled areas. It's reasonable to say that, for instance, many current and former military enlistees are co covertly implanted. They signed their lives away when they signed up. It's a good bet that everyone in the intelligence community is also covertly implanted as part of their job. Another good set of candidates for implantation is pretty much everyone who is highly visible in the public eye. I'm talking television actors, anchors, radio personalities. There's probably some covert implantation going on in prisons as well. And there are probably hospitals where no patient or newborn child leaves without a chip. There might be a program of covert mass implantation, but that begs the question of what the delivery vehicle might be. Anyway, this business of covert implantation is highly speculative. I'm only engaging in the speculation to head off even wilder speculation about mind control technology that's usable on virtually everyone. I'm sure they want to be able to control everyone, but that doesn't mean they're there yet. Keep your mind open and don't jump to conclusions, no matter how disturbing or pervasive the street theater gets. Part of the process involves the selection of mind control victims. Why are these people? Why not others? First of all, this technology clearly does not just get used on the targets complaining about it. It's just that they're the ones who are allowed to know about it. Many of the victims are basically nobodies. This makes them excellent candidates for experimentation, as nobodies won't be missed. There's roughly a thousand that we know of. There are probably others who have no idea what's going on, or who have miscategorized their experiences. Experimentation is just a label, and labels can be misleading. Like, if you're poking a caged animal with a stick, you could say you're experimenting on the animal to see how it reacts to being poked with a stick. But nobody else is going to see it that way, at least of all the animal. So you're going to see people who have been enrolled in programs that are described as experimentation, but in those cases, the experimentation serves another purpose, like silencing whistleblowers, or as a witness intimidation program. And once someone has been singled out for this so-called experimentation, that person is going to be exploited any way possible. For example, look at some of the incredible stories on the internet or on conference calls coming from mind control victims. These guys have been put to work. They're being used to discredit anyone who speaks up about these activities, and they're being used to terrorize other experimentees. Now we get to the deception. The very first act of deception for many mind control subjects revolves around how the activities start. In reality, the target was probably being watched and experimented on covertly long before the obvious experimentation started. If you watch someone long enough, eventually they'll annoy someone else. That someone else can be a useful patsy. If a patsy doesn't materialize, one can be sent in. The activities themselves are often disguised as something else. Mind control technology can, in principle, simulate any sensation. So if a target is convinced he's being attacked with energy weapons, it might be mind control instead. Sometimes, even if there's evidence left behind. The technology can also emulate what appears to be widespread interest in the target's activities, or even widespread hostility. People in the target's vicinity can be made to act out. A major factor that makes all this work is the use of exceptional and memorable events in the target's life. These unusual events will clearly not be the product of mind control. The target is intended to see those events and interpret subsequent similar events as being more stealthy or more advanced versions of an underlying event they're anchored to. Then we get to self-deception. And here I have to say, that the boundary between self and the victim's handler is intentionally blurred. But ultimately, they do want you to harm yourself, to deceive yourself. That's how they justify the activities to themselves, and that's how they lower the target's resistance to manipulation, because the targets feel it's all their fault. Self-deception is closely related to confirmation bias. An example of confirmation bias? 
Let's say that I've got the idea of Santa's elves are breaking into my apartment every time I turn my back. So I search for evidence supporting this idea, and I ignore contrary evidence. I find a red fiber on the carpet. See? That's evidence. This fiber must have come from their clothing. I find a smudge. Footprints. But there's no surveillance footage. Well, elves are sneaky that way. If you look for evidence of what you believe to be true, and you ignore contrary evidence, that's confirmation bias. That's not a good way of solving problems. When I prove the way I did in that example, it looks ridiculous. Of course nobody would do that. But for mind control victims, confirmation bias is created out of thin air. The mind control victims are looking for confirmation. The confirmation seems to come to them and that's deliberately engineered by their handlers. For a more general example, confirmation bias runs rampant in politics. If you picked a side, what, Republican or Democrat or Libertarian, you're looking for evidence that your side is good and the other guys are evil, and ignoring contrary evidence. And you can always find examples to support what you're looking for. I do have to say that probably a lot of people over the age of 40 get this idea. They understand that public discourse is rooted in confirmation biases, logical fallacies, delusional thought patterns, and so on, but they have their own incentives to play along. There is a worldwide conspiracy, the Santa Claus conspiracy, in which adults conspire to deceive their children about Christmas. Lots of people are in on it, and society is a lot like that. Another example of playing along, the housing bubble during the Bush presidency. You know, that housing bubble six years ago where millions of people knew, they just knew, that real estate was a sound investment that could only go up, and they had to buy it on credit. Many people actually involved with the real estate industry, like construction contractors and mortgage companies, knew what was going on, but felt it was to their advantage to pretend and go along. So the suckers who really believed the lies, everywhere they turned, they found confirmation of their beliefs that real estate was a sound investment. And that's how confirmation bias is manufactured on a mass scale. My control victims just get personal attention. Confirmation bias is a step down the path of the alteration of belief systems, or brainwashing. In the context of mind control, the subject's beliefs are probed. More information is fed to him that reinforces certain beliefs, and so on. It's a form of feedback or cybernetic control, and I'll be getting more into that later. Okay, now I'll get into the major tactics of deception used against subjects of mind control experimentation. One of the big ones is something I'm calling causality inversion. The idea is your private actions seem to trigger a response. This response will be highly visible, highly public, or seemingly reflecting a huge expenditure of resources directed at you, which is unnerving. The root of the deception is this. The cause and effect relationship you perceive is the reverse of what it really is. You think your private actions cause those responses, but you've got it backwards. Those responses caused your private actions. Your handlers had full knowledge of those events, and made you act them out shortly before they happened. Some examples. The classic example of causality inversion is media mirroring. For instance, you say something and a character on the TV set immediately repeats it. Or you watch a new episode of a TV program and it's echoing everything you've done for the last week. You are made to act out what you are going to see on the TV in advance. Another one I've heard a few people complaining about is construction crews that set up shop near your residence shortly after you move in, every time you move. And you're thinking construction contractors are being paid off to harass you. But a much simpler, much more economical explanation is that you didn't choose your new residence of your own free will. You were herded into a location where construction was about to start up. Here's a good psychological operation that's given a few people lots of grief. Poison the food items in the, in the supermarket. 
And let me emphasize that mind control victims who get this treatment will have very good reasons to believe they're being poisoned, probably because they really were poisoned in the beginning. This is the idea I was talking about earlier, anchoring psychological operations to exceptional or memorable events that definitely aren't mind control. Anyway, you go to the supermarket and every time you show up, they're restocking the shelves of the items that you want to buy, every single time. Well, you were mind controlled into going to the supermarket at that time when they were restocking. And of course, some mind control may be used on the supermarket crew themselves to make them give subtle signs that they're hostile to you. But the main thing is, the major event, the restocking of the shelves, wasn't scheduled with you in mind. You were moved into place to see this event at the time it was happening and to be terrorized by the implied threat. Another example, you keep running across newspaper articles and books that seem to be referring to events in your life. The books, if published years or decades before the events in question, can be especially unnerving if you think they refer to you. You're thinking, they must have been planning this for decades. But in reality, they found some books which seem to refer to your personal life and mind controlled you into finding them and reading them. And the newspaper articles, that can be another example of media mirroring. Or if you're getting your news online, another possibility is internet connection tampering. It's not all about electronic mind control. It's about brainwashing, which mind control is an important part of. But controlling what you see and experience is also important by any means necessary. Okay, the next major class of deceptive tactics is psychological operations involving the apparent use of advanced technology that seemingly defies the laws of physics. Remember, they want the people they're terrorizing, and you're one of them, to believe they're much more powerful than they are. The big one that a lot of mind control victims struggle with is energy weapons attacks. And again, this may be anchored to memorable events where the target really was attacked with energy weapons. Microwave weapons aren't exotic, and neither are class 4 lasers. But the common sense countermeasures targets of this treatment try to apply somehow don't seem to work. So they start reading up on the subject, not realizing that even as they try to do research online, they're being fed misleading information. So they might find, for example, news items about weapons testing in their area, and they think, aha, this must be what's being used against me. And the symptoms seem to be a good match. The target's handlers are creating confirmation bias. Well, if you can't shield against it, if you can't measure it, then you are mistaken about what they're doing. Getting back to the idea of implants I mentioned earlier, if you're implanted, and let's say the implants are programmable, then there's no shielding that will work. You buy a steel cage or whatever, a harassment routine is loaded into your implants, you enter the cage, and shortly afterwards the attack set in. And you're thinking, my god, they can get through anything. But really, you brought the electronic harassment into the cage with you. Another trick they use, and I see uh, a couple of high-profile targets have fallen for this one, is the future viewing screen. You wander by a room and happen to glance in, and you see technicians watching a video feed of you, but it's not real time. A little while later, you wander through an area which seems very familiar. Wait a second, that area was on the video feed. You do a double take and you realize that you have echoed the actions they are watching. They are peering into the future. Now, you are mind controlled into walking into that area. You are then mind controlled to act out those actions. That video feed they were watching wasn't a feed from the future. It was a clever forgery. Why did someone go to all this trouble? So you publish it on your website, like a few have or you come into the conference calls and terrorize other targets, like I've also seen happen. Remember, the handlers know the mind control victims are in touch with each other. They know the mind control victims are going to share stories. They want it to happen. They want you guys to create powerful confirmation bias for each other. The most believable source of disinformation is the people you trust most, other victims of the same tactics. Moving along, some other cons I've heard about, holograms. 
The idea of holograms that can be projected in the midair is supported only by disinformation spread on the internet. In reality, if you think you've seen holograms, probably what you're really seeing is augmented reality imposed on your optic nerve or visual cortex. I've seen this. I'm not really convinced about how realistic the images can be, at least with my eyes open during daylight. But some people may be more susceptible to this than others. I've heard a few people complaining about teleportation themed harassment. One example, let's say you walk into a room to get something you wanted, and there it is in the usual place, and all of a sudden it disappears with an audible popping sound. And then you search your living quarters and find it somewhere else, hidden in a drawer, say. Well, chances are the object was in a drawer the whole time, and the object you saw in the expected place was really an illusion what some mind control victims call holograms, or what I call augmented reality. Break-ins while you're asleep? You probably had some obvious break-ins in gaslighting early on. And so when gaslighting happens while you're asleep, you probably think this is just a stealthier kind of break-in, even if you haven't managed to catch the intruders. You might barricade your room, but they still somehow manage to leave traces of intrusion. Now, there's a possibility that the intrusion happened before you slept, but you didn't notice at bedtime because it was dark. And this psyop has been used on me. But I'll assume you've ruled that out. So obviously, you think, they must have broken in. What else could it be? And depending on your scientific literacy, that opens you up to more campaigns of technology-themed disinformation. Teleportation, remote levitation, people with invisibility suits sneaking around your residence, and so on. The simplest answer is that you are mind controlled during your sleep to gaslight yourself. Another tactic I've heard about is the draining of batteries in electronics, seemingly at will. Here I have to say that there are techniques which you can learn about online to remotely drain the batteries of cell phones, using cell phone jammers for instance, or bombarding them with Bluetooth messages. But some of this happens to devices that aren't cell phones and often that aren't even networked, like portable video cameras, for example. Well, one obvious answer is tampering with the electronics inside to make that kind of remote draining possible. But you probably went to a store and picked out the device yourself because you don't trust mail order, and you kept this device in your possession at all times. There's no way they could have gotten to it, right? Well, there is a weak link, namely, your choice of the device at the store. Did they have a hand in what device you bought, seemingly of your own free will? Maybe you were mind controlled into picking out a compromised device, a CIA special, so to speak. One last example of technology themed psychological operations real time hacking that takes place even when your computer is not on a network. Here, I'm describing something where we've ruled out the obvious answers, like spyware which conceals your network status. I'm assuming you've ruled things like that out. So you type something or do something on your computer, and you get a message which is a response to what you're doing on the computer, an intelligent response, and it's not connected to any network. And maybe you're thinking they're somehow using directed energy weapons to control your computer remotely. A much simpler answer is, you have spyware on your computer which is running a pre-scripted routine and you are mind controlled to act out in advance of that routine so that it seemed that it was responding directly to you, intelligently. In other words, this would be a combination of causality inversion, which I've already talked about, and technology-themed psyops. Okay, so I've covered technological shows of force. I've covered causality inversion. These are two major components of something big, which is used against mind control experimentees. It's something I'm calling the big show. The idea behind the big show is this. You are intended to see the things you've seen, even the so-called accidental slip-ups or chance encounters. There are no accidents. There may be operatives who stage things for you to see and remember, especially in the beginning. Or, the mind control may merge with harassment from people the controlling agency was watching. Like, for instance, a few targets have said their problems started with run-ins with pedophile rings. Those guys, those pedophile rings, are watched and protected by the CIA. 
the CIA has an interest in pedophiles and their victims for blackmail and other purposes. Anyway, almost everything else is mind control used on you and on people around you. It's done very deceptively, as I've tried to convey in this podcast. You are intended to get in touch with other targets so you can share stories and create very powerful confirmation bias in each other. That's part of the show. You're also putting on a performance for the general public to see, to display yourself or people like you by association. That's the big show hypothesis. It's only a hypothesis, but a very strong one, which holds a lot of weight with people who have experienced obvious forms of mind control. It makes more sense than just about any other explanation I've heard of. Trying to end this installment on an uplifting note, I'm raising the question, can you beat this? Sure, you could spend the rest of your life in a steel-plated coffin, but that's not practical for anyone. And most individuals receiving this treatment are not going to have the resources to find and disable implants, assuming they're implanted. And we can't count on governments to help out. To put it as simply as I can, we can't allow our well-being to depend on the cooperation of distant and effectively unaccountable power brokers. I've seen a few ways that individuals can resist the effects of mind control without making themselves stand out or inconveniencing themselves too much. For example, some targets who are receiving the non-stop versus treatment have found that by wearing headphones and using binaural beat soundtracks to entrain their brains, the voices become a lot less disturbing. This technique might be useful in fighting other applications of mind control technology as well. You can fight causality inversion or the synchronization of others' activity with your own by randomizing trivial decisions. You can use a fair coin toss or a dice roll to choose from several alternative courses of action. When it comes to non-trivial decisions, you want to avoid acting thoughtlessly. There has to be a good reason for everything you do. If you don't have a reason, then you're handing control over to an outside force. Finally, let me point out that there's no such thing as absolute control. The link between a mind control subject and his handler is a feedback loop, a cybernetic system of control. They're manipulating you, yes, but when you take an unexpected course of action, they have to alter their actions to account for this novel situation. In other words, under certain circumstances, you can have some control over them. The mind control victims who get the idea of messing with their tormentors or trying to waste their time are on the right track. They're just directing their energies at the wrong people. They should be focusing not on the puppets, but on the puppet masters. If you have an accurate model of what the puppet master looks like, what his motivations are, what tools he has available to him, then you may be able to fight him off. They know this as well as I do, which is why deception plays such an important role in mind control experimentation. The more intelligent you are, the more scientifically literate you are, the less effective their lies will be. More importantly, the more informed you are about their game plan and their methods of brainwashing, the better you'll be able to resist. That's what this audio has been all about.